He's a very unique person. He was very gifted in meditation. He could easily sit in a completely breathless meditation for an hour, hour and a half. And I contacted him every 10, 5, 10 years ever since we left. And I contacted him recently. And I asked him, even in his old age, you know, and he's paralyzed, you know, he walks with a, he's got this rare disease, they have to completely empty all the blood out of his system once a month and put new blood in, it's a very expensive procedure, and he's on a, a very powerful medication, but even now, his mind is so clear, he can still uh, sit in completely uh, breathless states for, for uh, easily for an hour. When we used to meditate in the Chan Hall when we were young young monks, everybody would be sitting you know, so straight and you know, trying to be so rigid and everything and focused and look so 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 zen. So zen. And he used to joke, you know, and, and he would just kind of like go like this like he was sleeping, but he would be in his breath of samadhi, going to this, these different heavens and stuff. And every night, a lot of people don't know that some of these stories, so I'm sharing with you some things that are very interesting that very few people know. He used to, the, the master's room was on the third floor. And because he was so gifted in the samadhis, what he would do is, on show, would go up on the roof every night, right above where the master sat in meditation. And he would enter samadhi. And the master in his room would enter samadhi. And Hong Shou described many of the Shurfu, our, our teacher, would take him on voyages to the pure, different pure lands, Ramitava, Akshobhya, and these different pure, pure lands and samadhis, and different realms. And he had a, uh, and he described some of these places. It was totally incredible. Really have. And this went on on a nightly basis for a long, 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 long time. Right. I and never met him, you know. He, he's, a, he's one of the very, very gifted uh, practitioners. He lived in um, San Francisco for a very short time. I, he, then he was abbot of the uh, Hong Kong monastery on Lantau Island. Mm -hmm. for, for a while. And uh, so recently I had a chance to see him again. I haven't seen him in a long time. I don't know uh, if you are aware that the City of 10,000 Buddhas uh, recently celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Master's passing. A big celebration recently. Uh, two years ago? No. Just about a few few months ago, oh, really? yeah, a big celebration, and uh, many people came and they did documentaries on recordings on what it was like to be with the master from some of the students that had uh, the opportunity to study with them. So one of the the uh, jobs was to uh, record myself. <laughs> and, and, then, and then I got recorded twice for about two hours each time. And then my friend, who on the show, who was too weak to travel, I went to New York and I, I recorded uh, a tape of him. I mean, oh, the same as that. He was really enjoyed it. Because it talks about very simple things, but like with, that he did with the master, you know, like uh, how. He talked about how it, he went, uh, the master would do things. Like one time he asked, asked him to drive him to this garage. And he went to, he drove him to this garage and the master had built this cable. And he described how this cable was so stable and so perfect. And not necessarily aesthetically perfect, like you would want to buy this table, but there was something about it that looked so solid. And it's like it was indestructible. And it was, it's, to me, it's kind of analogous to the, to the mind and uh, how it is, how it's 
its indestructible and stable nature. And he, he talked about very simple things. He said that one time he just watched the master clipping his, his, his fingernails. And, and he observed how perfectly he did it. Just absolutely perfectly. With perfect awareness. It was, it was just like, he said, the time he watched him clip his fingernails, it was, it got him, his mind so absorbed. It was like he was watching a, an artist paint a masterpiece painting. <laughs> And uh, there's a, there, were, there are many stories uh, that uh, we discuss in this video. Mm -hmm. And uh, his life about about his life with the, with the, the teacher that we all we share. But what about your own experience? My own, yeah, my own experience. I was. Uh, it was uh, being around the master. What would you like to know? <laughs> what would you like to tell? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of the stories that I told. Uh, okay. Actually, I was asked to speak uh, on a, it was a, a live worldwide broadcast. And I was going up for this celebration and, then they, and they asked me to talk about eight, eight, uh, uh, about uh, eight o'clock in the morning. I didn't know I was supposed to talk, and then I still didn't have anything to say. You know, I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't know that they were speaking, so I didn't want to say anything. And uh, uh, when I said I would talk, was I was if somebody asked, I would have to talk. So there was only six speakers. And I was one of them, and then uh, in the Guanyin Hall, and the cameras were rolling, and all of the people were there. And so I still really, and then I, I walk up, and Hung Shou, <laughs> Hung Shou says, you know what you're going to say? I said, no, I don't know what I'm going to say. And, uh, and he said, well, just tell us something, you know, about what you thought you were going to happen, and stuff, and, and what your life, or your experience, or surfer. <coughs> So I still didn't really know what I was going to say. And there's a big Guan Yin statue that's 18 feet tall in that hall. And so all the other speakers, they, uh, they went up and spoke before the Guan Yin. And they, they gave these long, beautiful speeches. And uh, we were limited to nine minutes. And then they would ring a bell and we would have to show up. So I was kind of I was kind of I was kind of thinking well that's that's great you know because I'm all I could, I could maybe just be quiet for nine minutes but then instead I had the idea that well I, when I got up to the podium I turned around and I bowed to Guan Yin three times no none of the other speakers did that so I don't know if it made a difference but then I turned around and started to talk. I just, just uh, said what came to mind. And uh, some of the things that came to mind was that, uh, I'll tell you one of the main things that came to mind, is that I looked at everybody there, and I realized that the reason that they asked me to, to speak is because they wanted here from someone that had spent a lot of time with the master. And I was with the church for 10 years. For three years, I lived, my door, his door was one, like where that door is, and my door was here, where I sat and meditated and slept, and the church was where was there. There was a period of time where the master and I, when I would be stand, sitting in meditation, I would, the master used to leave his room and he'd often come and check on me and see what I was doing. But I always I meditated all day when I first went there. And I didn't need to do so that I did. You don't know that he's standing. He doesn't lie down. He's standing. So he didn't sit down. <coughs> How many years do that? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, he, he would do that, the standing meditation. Bang Chao Tamo. 
So, so I would be sitting in meditation, and then there was a period of time that I'd know when Shifu was going to come. Because he used to come anyway, and he'd check on me, and sometimes he'd just walk around me a few times, and he'd poke me, and then he'd leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, just, and then, uh, so, there was a, a time when I'd be sitting, and I know he was going to come. So I'd, I'd go to the, his door, and I'd know when he was going to open it. And just before he'd grab it, I grabbed the handle and opened it for him. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then he'd smile, you know. And he'd, he'd kind of laugh a few times. And then we did this for a while, for maybe uh, five, ten times, I don't remember how many times. And he'd always smile and then he'd walk off. And he'd sometimes back to my room and then sometimes into the hall where I'd follow him around and he'd go to scold somebody and I'd follow him and follow him. And and then one time I was there and I knew he was going to op open the door. So I went and I opened the door. And he gave me this really negative look. You know, like it's not funny anymore. You know, okay, this joke is over, you know. And so I stopped. You know. But, so I had the opportunity to, to be very close in a way to the, the master. And, and uh, I realized these, the people that were there at this gathering, the several thousand people, they asked me to talk to, be, to know what it was like being with the master. But then I thought, you know what, that there are many people that, that have never been with the master, so to speak, that, because the master passed away a number of years ago. Some are new disciples. <coughs> Some, because of geogra geography and whatnot, they had an opportunity to be with the Master. But they practice very seriously and dedicated their life to, to Buddhism and studying what the Master taught. And so I, I said that the reason I'm here is because you think I had, want to hear my experience and, because I was close to the Master. But the, the reality is that it is your practice that makes you close to the Master. And I truthfully said to them, I said, there's no doubt in my mind that there are many of you here today that are as close or closer to the Master than many of us who spend time with him in this physical body. Because the Master is not, when he died, Before he came, you know, in his physical body, his dharma essence, his dharma teachings, mind continuum was there. And connecting with the master is not necessarily in the physical form, but through the discipline of practice. So, to my mind, that there was not a single individual in that room that potentially was as close or closer to the master than I was myself, who had much time with him. Why? Because by virtue of their practice. So when we when we see people, you know, we, we, we know it's their practice, the Dharma practice. By virtue of discipline, you connect with the teacher. If you're the the harder you work, the, in your practice, the closer you are to the teacher. It's not becoming physically close in the temple or anything. There's a Hindu yogi, great Hindu yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda. He came and spread Hinduism to America. And he only saw his teacher once after he came to America for 40 years or so. As much as he wanted to see his teacher. But he was fulfilling his teacher's wish and he was connected to his teacher's mind stream and mind continued. And so when I left my teacher, I didn't feel it. I didn't even say goodbye. You know, I didn't 
I just left because it's my physical body. And, you know, words can't express that connection. And so I never felt like I had disconnected with Buddhism and or my teaching ever for even a, a second. And the great, great practitioner on the show in New York in my mind, he echoes my words also, and he finds no reason to see the master, or be near the master, even when the master is living, seeing every five or ten years was enough. When 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 I uh, when I had left for a long, long time, about 20, 20 years, yeah. and I went to Nepal and I raised a family. <coughs> I hadn't seen Sherpa in a long, long time, <coughs> over 20 years, and the, uh, he was very ill at the time. He was staying in a secret location in, in uh, West, West, Covina. West Covina that nobody knew. And I and I didn't know either. But I called my friend Hongshuo, who's a spiritual penetrationist. Sherpa said he opened his five eyes and six, six, six spiritual penetrations. And so I asked him, I said, well, where is Sherpa? And he knew. And he gave me the address. He probably knew not through psychic means. He probably knew through some inner connections with the monastery. But so I went to. Uh, I decided I'd go see Sherfu. <coughs> and just to give you an idea on how things things work. Closeness, uh, what's really important and, and meaningful and make, make sense, and how when you're with a master, whether you're not with a master, you're still sort of with him all the time. I was thinking, after not seeing him so many years, what should I bring the master? And I, I had inherited some money, so I thought, well, should I bring some money? Oh, that's completely ridiculous. Bring money? Excuse me. So I thought, what should I bring him? Well, there was a, many, many years before, that was a young monk, and I had just been met sure, for a year or two. I used to lead the master, bring the master his food every day. And some days the master, most of the time he ate upstairs in his room, but sometimes he ate in the dining hall. So, I was asked to, uh, I, I was always drinking the food one way or the other, but this time he was supposed to eat in the dining hall, you know, with everyone, which he did often. So I was the uh, head of the assembly at the time, so I was leading the master into the dining hall after the meal offering. And we got to everybody's, there was food on all everybody's places, all the bowls were there and everything. And we got to Sherpu's table, and I was leading Sherpu to his table, and they forgot to put the food up for Sherpu, or any setting, or anything. And Sherpu looked, and I looked, and then Sherpu turned around, and he went back into the Buddha hall, and he sat in the center of the Buddha hall. And, and I said to myself, if Sherfu's not eating, then I'm not eating. So I went into the Buddha Hall too. And it was just Sherfu and my son. I sat in meditation. Sherfu was the Samadhi. And then I heard the bell ring at the beginning of the chant. Just when I heard the bell ring, I had an idea. I remember when I was. In, during my uh, hippie days, my health fanatic days, a, a very nice drink I used to make with celery, beans, and some carrots and things. And I thought, maybe, well, they're coming in. I can make it really quick and bring it to Sherpa. Maybe he will, he will take that. So 
everybody was coming in to close the meal offering, end the meal offering. The church was still sitting in meditation in the Samadhi. And they did their uh, end of meal offering, and then I made the drink. Then I came back into the hall, and everybody was gathered around Sherpa. Everybody felt very bad. And we were talking to Sherpa. And, uh, and Sherpa was un unmoved, and, you know, as if nothing happened, he was talking to them all and trying to make them feel that everything was okay. And, and I came with the drink. And I said to Sherpa, Sherpa, he wasn't going to take anything. I said, Churchill, you please take this drink. And so, Churchill took it and he hesitated a second. And then he started to drink a little bit. And then his eyes lit up with his smile, like his big smile, like he said, what is this? You know, it's like ambrosia from heaven or something. They drank the whole thing. And so, fast forward uh, 30 years, when I was thinking, well, what should I bring the master? I thought of that drink. So I prepared the same drink. And I brought it to Vescovina. And Sherpa was so sick and ill at the time that he was almost unconscious. And they would feed him with a um, spoon. And they would hold, his, hold it up for him. And I brought my two daughters and my uh, Nepalese wife at the time, and, and uh, did prostrations to Shurfu. And I remember him saying, you have many children. Maybe he saw some others. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was very, very weak. And I put the drink on the table for Shurfu to have. But there was very big restrictions about what Shurfu could take. So that drink, as soon as I put it there to give to Shurfu, one of the attendants you know, they took the drink off and they said, no, sure, you can't have this, and they put it in the kitchen. And Shurfu was a, <coughs> surf, and then I, and then Shurfu, had, I started to talk to Shurfu. And I thought I was very upset because the drink I wanted him to have, it was no longer there. And so the master asked me, he said, uh, I, told, I told the master, I said, Shurfu, you know when I left? I went to Nepal and I met so I had the good fortune to meet great masters like you. That I'm just like you, sir. You know, enlightened some enlightened masters. And Shurfu Shurfu was very enthusiastic and he lit up, even though he was so sick. That he, this was only a couple of three weeks before he passed away. Nine ninety-five. Yeah. And I said I said and, and he became very enthusiastic and he says, write their names down for me. I want to know some of these teachers who you met. So I wrote down the names of the people. And I, but I was still thinking about it. I sure wish he could drink that drink. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sherfu and I talked some more. And just a little bit more. And then out of the blue, Sherfu said, who took away the drink? There was a drink there. And he ordered the person to bring the drink back. And he drank that drink. <laughs> 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 and then I went home. And then I called him one more time on the phone and I talked to him. And you see, we only talked for a few minutes that night. And then he just said, why do you want to talk to me? We already talked. It was enough. You know? So like, you don't have to be physically with the teacher and uh, to be with the teacher. You're, the teacher's dar dharma body is the real body. So if you can stay with that dharma body, practice pure discipline. And not care what other people think, and not care about <coughs> if uh, if uh, what your peers think, or that your meditation, or you think too much about meditation, and you don't think about other things enough, or whatever. Be true to your own practice. If you don't, 
med meditation and Dharma practice is not like this. For me, it's like this, usually. But other people have other ways to practice. There's many ways. And the, the, the mind is confined to a specific form of practice, but it, it only should be some sense of discipline, of giving, of, uh, you know, there should be love in the practice, there should be joy in the practice, it should be absorbing. So one of the stories, I promised I'd tell the story, so I didn't know what I was going to say before all of these people, so I told the story about what uh, it was like to be around the master. And I think our master, Hong Chong, knows that and everybody that had been around the master was, is, he's a very, if you, the harder you work, actually, the more difficult it is to be around the master. Because it's like the master was always one step ahead of you and always pushing you right until you bust. Yeah, bust. bust. You know, like you. <laughs> and everything, everything was important. Surf never did anything without some kind of meaning. You know, like sometimes, like Hung Wan was saying, one of his disciples said, like, walking through the hall one day and he just picked up a nail off the floor and he said, what is this? So, why he said that, I don't know. And what it meant to Hong Wan, I don't know. But it was a reason. Because Sherpa would never do anything casually. <coughs> and so, one day, uh, I, I used to sit in the Chong Hall facing uh, east. So I, I wrote a little note to Sherpa. I said, to see Amitabha in the Western Pure Land, how does one do this when facing east? So I gave Sherpa this note, and I forgot about the note you know, for some time. But I was serious, and I was serious about facing the east, this one direction, and I, got, I sat right next to the central Buddha image, not near the, where the regular meditation benches were, but it was a tiny gold mountain where I had my own little place. And to really appreciate this, you have to understand that Shurfu was always given many gifts from people all the time. And if you went into his room, it was full of soap and toothbrushes and like, tons of cloth and many different things. And so, I had given Shurfu this, this, this note, and I forgot about it. And then one day Shurfu came down, and I was the only one meditating in the, in the Chan Hall. Shurfu used to uh, allow me to meditate in the Chan Hall as much as I wanted. He, he told me that I didn't have to learn Chinese because I tried, and I didn't get anywhere. And so as strict as Shurfu was that everybody learned Chinese, finally one day he walked up to me and said, you don't have to study Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so Shurfu came down into the Chan Hall and he circumambulated the Buddha in reverse three times. And then he stopped, he, he stopped next to me and he started, you know, breathing down my neck so I couldn't ignore him. And I knew that the master was there, of course. I knew he was there for some time, standing next to me. And then he started getting closer to me, and he's sort of like breathing down my neck. And then I can't ignore him anymore and pretend I'm meditating. <laughs> so I, I look up and I say, hi, hi Shifu. And, and then, and then Shifu, he handed me a toothbrush. And then he walked away. So I looked at the toothbrush really carefully, you know, see if the Look at it. I thought, okay. You throw it under the Dowling bed, meditation bed. And then I go back to meditating. And little though I know that there's really a teaching there, not just the toothbrush, but I, I didn't get the teaching. I didn't see any teaching there. So I'm meditating, and then three days later, I'm. I'm sitting there and I'm in meditation and the toothbrush appears in the meditation. Like it's like bright and shiny like 
Right. <laughs> and I'm thinking about the toothbrush. I thought, okay, this is ridiculous to be thinking about this toothbrush from the bench. So I ignore the thought. You know, I'm trying, trying very hard to meditate, but I kept starting thinking about the toothbrush again. So I decided, okay, let's, let's see, maybe it left or something. <laughs> so I look under the dying bench, and there's a toothbrush. So I pick up the toothbrush, and I look at the toothbrush again, and I see what the brand is. The brand is Dr. West. <laughs> so how does he how do I see Amitabha in the Western Purana? Well, the city in meditation, basically. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's me. You have to look at the West all the time. <laughs> you know when it, you know often the master did things like that and. That's why it was so difficult because if you, when in Chan meditation, you have to either get it when it's the moment is right, where it's not going to, where the opportunity is missed. So this is a, an example of missing an opportunity. You know, I said, oh, I should. I looked at the toothbrush. Why didn't I see that? But, you know, so. That's a little bit of, of the, what I talked about. And they rang the bell after about 15 minutes, so it couldn't have been too bad because it went you know, about six minutes over the scheduled time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share with you one thing that did exactly not the count. When it was, I had been training, in 1989, the master told me that she was there. You have only one job. You fixate your mind on this dharma maybe 24 hours. You can't get your mind off on this topic. It's only one job. But the reason why you become an addict is I want to do this. So I take rest seriously. I didn't do anything else. You can go back home to the blue lesson and just sit there and do just that. But one day we we meditate, uh, we finished uh, the bowing in the morning, five o'clock, we come back. I walk back. It was kind of winter. Frost on the ground. The whole city was, you know, under frost. And then I walked by the guest hall. You remember the guest hall? Mm -hmm. On the way back from last week. And the lawn, there's beautiful white flowers coming out like this. And I stopped for just one minute, standing there, mm -hmm. breathing and watching this. Wow, oh, she's wonderful. You know, look at this whole winter here, and this flower, <laughs> wonderful. But then, ah, let's get back to meditation. I get back. We come back. And then, sure enough, only five minutes later, and this is about maybe 5.50 or 6 o'clock in the morning, Hang Zhao, Kalman, Roger Kalman, come up, run the bike down and said, hey, come up, Shibos, on the phone now. Told me to come up there. And so I, you know, went off to the, uh, to the office, <coughs> and she was on the phone, waiting for five minutes. And this is what he said. First thing that he said, he said, you think being mad is a joke? And I, I was shaking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the kind of, 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 of scary, it was made of us. And then he said, why would you have time to enjoy a flower? <laughs> just like that. <laughs> yeah, I swear to you, this is actual happening. It's unbelievable. No, it, it but it is believable that you were around the master. No. But this is exactly what Sue was about. You know, he's right on top of us. He didn't want me to mess around with it. And I I was I don't know whether I should cry or not. And I was mumbling and I said, you know, you go back and do it. I, I, I want you to do this. So you better own it. And so I get back you know, and then I went to this room, started to cry a little bit, but then, you know, it, it's so great that she has 
many things like Reading the time I was sitting, many, many of the things that I had all the time. And the one which who passed away, I'm talking about the Dharma body, which who passed away, and I was at the monastery, and, I, and there was a guy from uh, England, his name is Amaral Bikul. Mm -hmm. He came to us and. and I don't know who. I don't know. Who's Amaral? The one with the dent in his head? Is that the one? No. That's his friend then. There's yeah. two of them. I know. The one that's in from England. Yeah, that's big yeah. girl. Yeah, England. This is the Somalo so Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he came to the monasteries to learn with us the, uh, the fall to hands because he didn't know how we do the fall to hands. And, 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 and we, and myself, and the group in the office, we become the expert because Sufu. Yeah, I will tell you a story later about why is it. So we was, we were, we, we, were there and he was sitting, I'm here, he was right here, and the group sitting in the circle like this. This is like the perfect group. All the young officers there. And we were all reciting. So I taught him how to get the thing going, you know, in, in the way that we're supposed to do with the body hands and eyes. And as we I'm doing this because I have to take care of them. Because they have to close their eye and do the meditation. So I look straight. She was walking and sitting right there, looking straight at me. Close his leg, looking at me, and close his eyes. Why would I do this? And this after he passed away. He loved his master. After he passed away. After he passed away. He's sitting there, and we're doing it. I know, ask me, what's going on? What's wrong with you? Later, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? He saw I, I'm acting weird, you know. <laughs> I'm shaking weird, <laughs> and the young monks um, also noticed something wrong with me, meaning something was going on. But none of them seen the master. Mm. I saw him straight like that. He was sitting straight like that, crossing his leg, you know, like the normal thing, and going like that, and get his hand and then go like this, go like this. Notice that it never he go like this. Look straight at me. Isn't that amazing. But this after he passed away. Now I get a ton of a story like that after he passed away. 